Time to begin this evening. Take a song book and turn to 170. 170. And after the first song, please stand for a prayer if it's convenient for you. And possibly 170. All the way to my Savior, me what am I to ask beside? Can I die?
or the invitation will be 647 if you mark, mark that in your books first. Present number is 179. 179. When I survey the wondrous cross, on which the Prince of Glory died, my riches came by the cross, and were content on my If you need a lesson, uh, Ivan will give you a single sheet here. It's uh, Jimmy Corner Scripture number 18, talking about the uh, love of money and our conscience. And at first you may say, well, what does that have to do one with the other? And uh, it becomes rather obvious, of course, especially knowing the Scriptures as we do, that uh, we'll say a number of things this evening that hopefully will open some doors and better understanding of um, about our conscience and about the love of money and uh, various aspects of, of all of that. So if you have your booklet, uh, this is uh, page 18. And as I said, uh, the uh, 18th offering of the Chimney Corner Scripture column focuses on an actual biblical passage that is so often misquoted. In 1 Timothy 6.10, the Apostle Paul said, For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. At the chimney corner, it is often said that money is a root of all sorts of evil. There is a difference. It is the omission of the word love. Good stewards or managers of money use it as a tool. They use it to serve their better interests. They do not serve it. It serves them. The problem, of course, is in loving it so much that one allows greed to control his or her thoughts and actions. Money can be doted on so much that it becomes a god to the person abusing it. That is why it is important that we separate the actual biblical words from the usual misquotation around the fireplace. Another chimney corner scripture is, let your conscience be your guide. The Bible does not use that phrase. It does speak of what can happen to one's conscience. It can be educated. It can be seared. It can bring about conviction. It can be good. It can bear witness. It can be weak. It can be another's concern. Something can be done for conscience sake. All the foregoing words can be found in the Scriptures. Never, however, is the conscience said to be one's sole authority for doing something in the religious realm. That is, one's conscience might allow him or her to do something that the Lord does not allow, and that would be sinful. 
If led solely to the conscience, one might violate God's law. There are certain things that require an active conscience. It is to help guide us even in religious matters. Again, it should never be the only thing considered in making decisions. The danger of doing so is expressed in Hebrews 3.13. But encourage one another after day, day after day, as long as it is still called today, lest any of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. When a person's conscience is seared, 1 Timothy 4.2, one tends to speak lies in hypocrisy. The conscience should be educated, educated with Bible knowledge. It should be trained with scriptural data and used by the man or woman who is willing to acknowledge God and His Word as the final authority. Not only conscience in decision making. So study with us this week on the invest, and investigate the love of money and the conscience. So those three scriptures in the upper left hand corner there on the slide uh, help us to remind ourselves of what I just read and what I referred to. Uh, in that article. Let's stop there for just a moment and see if anyone has any comments on the article or on 1 Timothy, Hebrews, uh, or the second uh, passage in 1 Timothy chapter 4. Thing you might like to say. I'm just thinking, of course, we've all <coughs> said this on this uh, 1 Timothy uh, 16. You know, it says for, for the love of money. <coughs> It doesn't say the money itself, it says the love. And you can go through all the scriptures to see where, you know, like Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, you know, it wasn't the fact that they <clears throat> wanted to keep part of the money or half part of it, it was the fact that they liked it. <coughs> Which, you know, I mean, they were being, uh, they wanted it, yet they wanted to look good. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, you know, there's a distinction between the money itself and the good you can do with it and the evil things that you can do if you're. If you're uh, if you got to have yeah, ulterior motives, yeah. Yeah, Acts chapter 5 with Ananias and Sakari is the reference to the item here. Jane? Uh, I'd like to include verse 17 of that verse 26. Okay. It says, Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, not to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Okay, verse 17 that Jane just read of that first first Timothy 6 uh, chapter explains why verse 10 says what it does. Uh, there are those who are rich. There are those who are well off. And that is not to say that the rich are condemned to hell, but they can be or they need to learn to be good stewards, good managers. Uh, this is what always, uh, and I realize this doesn't happen all the time, but so many people uh, will blame people who are rich because they just assume that they have been crooked to get their money. That may or may not be so. There are a lot of rich people who have worked hard to get that money. They have gotten an education. They have made wise, wise investments. Uh, they are to be admired and respected for the achievements and for their success. So to hear a lot of people today in our society, uh, you're condemned if you're rich. And that's uh, that's not that's not so. And that's exactly what James is reading there in verse 17. There is a way for a rich man, those who are better off, better blessed, uh, to handle their riches. So that's important. Glenn? There's a big movement, I guess, going on now talking about tax the rich. The yes. Tax the real poor. I seen an article yesterday, something I don't even know where, but. Yeah. That's why some gal had, a, had a dress on and said that on it on her own life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, taxing the rich. That's always been a big problem. Yeah. Uh, and that, that's the ones I was kind of talking about or had reference to a while ago that just because they are rich, they have to pay more taxes. Well, that's kind of an unwritten law and even now wanting to be a written law. But just because they are rich doesn't mean that they got it dishonestly. And as a, I know I'm not naive enough to believe that Everybody would fall into the category of, of being honest because I know a lot of people are rich because they were dishonest and they did cheat. They were liars. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there aren't those out there who are uh, using good judgment. Yeah, I, I, uh, I've seen that too on the news. And I think she's one of the riches and she thinks out with all the riches. And she, it was kind of like Anna Nelson's fire rat. It kind of reminded me of that. Mm -hmm. She wants to look good, but yet she, yeah, yeah. But behind the scenes, she wants she wants to get all the money. 
But yeah, what is it Peter? What is it Peter tells Ananias and Sapphira? By the way, that is the key to that. Well, it was yours. You had to exactly right. Yeah. As long as it was under your control, you or you had it. It was under your control. Yeah, that's the key. And uh, that's it was a sign of sorcery. He told him to said your money perish with you because yes. you meant the wrong thing. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Any other thoughts on any of those? The Hebrews 3.13, I like especially too. That's the reason I listed it. But uh, A lot of people get into trouble because we don't encourage one another day after day. Um, and when we don't, then we become hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And so we, uh, we need encouragement. And rather than taxing the rich or... Or uh, I'm not saying I shouldn't say it that way that putting a burdensome tax on the rich just because they're rich. Uh, we really should encourage those who are industrious enough, those who are talented enough, those who can manage well their money. Uh, show us how you do it. You know, if if you've done this honestly, uh, encourage me. Then I might go and do the same thing. Um, I, I've learned that in, in preaching that. There are so many things that, that I don't know when I listen to other preachers. And I, sometimes I get the feeling, why don't I even try? Because they're so much better than I am and what they know and the way they present it and, and all of this. And yet, I have to kind of shake myself and say, they're setting a good example, a higher standard for you to live up to. And so that makes me just try that much harder. I hope that I have matured and grown over the years to where I'm better now than I was 50 odd years ago when I started preaching. And anybody who is in any vocation or profession would hope for that same goal setting, the same achievement. That where, whether it's digging ditches or being a lawyer or a physician or uh, a race car driver, any, anything that you can mention, that experience and, and, and being good management, a good steward, it's a secret to, uh, and, and I admire people like that. I don't always agree with some of their philosophies, but I do appreciate them and admire them for the success that they've had. Well, it kind of reminds me of what you were just talking about, uh, all the different men with different talents, but there are different amounts that were given to them. You know, yes. Compare. Yes. And not everybody gets the same ability, yeah. but do the best with what you got. That's a good point. Is that, is that Matthew 25 with the parable of the talents? Somewhere I think it is. Yeah. yeah. You've been given talent. Of course, talents are pieces of money as they are, but we all oftentimes use it as abilities or capabilities. Uh, but whatever the Lord has given you, you know, make good use of that. Uh, if you're a good song leader, don't hold back. Get up and lead singing. Uh, not to show off, not to be egotistical about it, but uh, if you're capable of leading singing or encouraging others to sing along with you. I've, I've heard the comment made about some of you here that others are saying, well, she or he is sitting in front of behind me and I could hear them. They're tremendous singers. As long as they're singing, that encourages me to sing and at least try to do better. So you don't know what along those lines and, and you know how much good you are doing. Uh, and I just picked out singing there as an example or any number of things that we can encourage others. Again, the Hebrews 3.13, encourage one another day after day while it's still called the day. And that is the urgency of it, the immediacy of it. Don't procrastinate, don't put it off. Well, I meant to encourage them, but I never, never, never did, now they didn't go. You know, we, we've had that happen to us uh, on several occasions. I'm sure we all have. Where you, you need just maybe to help a sick person or to encourage a, a person, kind of lift their spirits and you say, well, I really need to stop by and see her. I really need to stop by and, and, and encourage him. And lo and behold, we just wait too long. And, and we've all done that. And it's always sad when we do. When we're heavy hearted. But as, as long as we understand this urgency, while it's still called today, it's like we always quote from 2 Corinthians 6, verse 2, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Don't procrastinate. Don't put it off. Take advantage of the time that you have now. Well, I'm getting a little preachy. Anything, <laughs> anything else there that anyone wants to say? 
this uh, then let's look at these passages concerning the love of money. We came back in the conscience and, uh, and we will in the, uh, the next slide after this one. But for just a few moments, let's uh, concentrate on the love of money. In uh, Matthew 6, 24, no man can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will hold to the one and despise it. You cannot serve God and mammon. Jane? Uh, verse, verses just before that in 19 and 21 talks about where your treasure is. Yes. That is where your heart is. Yes, 19 and 21, the verses before that uh, talk about where our treasure is laid up in heaven for us. That's where our heart is. What is the mammon, mammon, mammon being talked about here? You can't serve God and mammon. That is money, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Any thoughts on that scripture? Hebrews. Uh, <coughs> oh, let's skip First Corinthians thirteen. Oh, there. Uh, I've got all these down up here. <laughs> My bifocals are still adjusted. Uh, First Corinthians thirteen eight. Charity never fails. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Where there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. So the idea here of love and money is charity or love never fails. Now, when we have misplaced charity or misplaced love, or we chari uh, give charitably toward an organization or toward a, a person, that we are benevolent, we have to have, of course, the right attitude. And the results are going to be such that they will never fail. That love will not let us down. Uh, that some have the ulterior motive. They they love to be seen of men. Remember Jesus talked about this in Pharisees in Matthew 23. They love to stand on the street corners so people might hear their prayers. And, and they enlarge the phylacteries. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the box that holds the uh, scripture you know, on the wrist and on the forehead and all that. And they, they really put themselves out there to be seen of men. Um, a more modern day application of that is people who uh, wear their collars around backwards in order to be people to think that they are godly men or women. Uh, people who wear uh, jewelry uh, just for the purpose of drawing attention like a big gold chain with a cross around their neck. Uh, the real reason they wear that is because they want somebody to think or whoever meets them that they are religious. Well, that's, that's not saying that they're religious. It just means they have a heavy gold chain with a cross on it. <laughs> uh, it doesn't mean anything more than that. But uh, a lot of people think that they are religious. And this is kind of misplaced charity uh, where it can fail because it's not charity to begin with, not the love. And so Paul says when the motivation is right, when, the, uh, when everything is above board as it should be, uh, then it's not going to return to you void. Here. Yes. And, uh, that was exactly right here with that uh, money and, uh, and the concordance that it's described as well correct. Yes. So. Okay. Uh, we've already looked at Hebrews. Let's look at it again, chapter 13 and verse 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So here we have uh, covetousness being mentioned and contentment. It, it takes a, some intelligence and some managerial characteristics to be able to tell the difference here between being covetous and being content. Uh, we covet when, you, when somebody else has something or something that you want in your possession. And you covet that, that you have the wrong motive for getting that thing. If, on the other hand, you're content with such things as you have, then this is a blessing unto you. And sometimes people aren't content. We're, we're always wanting more. Back in the Old Testament, one of the prophets said that you fill your money with pockets that have holes in them. And that's oftentimes the case with people today, that they just spend, the old phrase is, the old cliche is, they're spending money like water. It's just going through the faucet and out into the sandy soil. 
and uh, not really doing anything except just, you know, they're not even lining their pockets. It doesn't stay long enough to line them. <laughs> it's just uh, like a hole in the purse. Uh, it just falls through. So here's what the Hebrew writer says about uh, covetousness and being content with such things you have. Comments on that? Be content to with those things that you have. Uh, no, the whole thing to me, it, it, it doesn't say you can't work to better yourself, but don't don't make that your, your main thing. <coughs> and a yeah. part of that seems to be it's also saying, you know, somebody else has gotten it, we'll be happy for it. Let's say they got it off. Yeah. Uh, so it's just, it's really just, it's just an attitude. I've often mentioned this before about Jane. Again, not to embarrass her, although I do all the time. But I remember me talking about she makes a cobbler or something in the in the oven, and she'll say it's not bubbling to my satisfaction. In other words, she's not content. It's not just quite right. Uh, she is. Some of you already know that she really did the flowers today up here, and I was just amused at her when I walked by here. She said something about that's just not right, and that one flower, whichever one it was just wasn't positioned to her satisfaction. She wasn't content. Uh, so contentment can go beyond possessions. It can mean having uh, a kind of integrity we talked about last week, that things need to be, uh, not that you're perfectionist necessarily, although that would certainly be the picture, uh, but things you have to be content with such things as you have. Uh, you know, it, it might be such a thing that we would want live flowers replaced up here every two days. You know that, <laughs> but being realistic about it, uh, we use the artificial ones. She goes over to what's that store you go to? Hobby Lobby. Hobby Lobby, and buys those, pays for them, brings them up here, puts them in. But they have to be just so. And uh, and the rest of us appreciate. I appreciate those. The reason I mention I appreciate those more than anybody because I'm here every day. I look at them every day, and I know you see them two or three times a week maybe at the most. Um, but she, I used to try to do it. And I can tell it didn't bring contentment to her. <laughs> I might have just been satisfied with the flower here. But, and it's the same thing with the pie or a cobbler. Well, it's done to me. Yeah, not quite done. So when we're talking about content, not just the possessions, but in the, the product, the quality of the product that we put out, or the, the project that we're working on. Uh, and, and some of you have dealt with some particular things in, in business or on assembly line or manufacturing to where a, a particular tool or a particular uh, die or whatever had to be within one one hundred thousandths of the, you know, whatever the standard of authority was. And so it's your job to make sure that that's exactly right. And you don't Accept it until you're contented with it. And you have, if you have integrity with your contentment, that means that you're doing it right. And that, so it can't be just a matter of saying, well, I, I did the best I could, you're just going to have to deal with it. But rather, the Christian is doing everything that he can right uh, to satisfy the Lord. Anything else about it? 1 Timothy 6.5 perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness from such withdraw thyself. You've heard the cliche, well, they're into it for the money. That's what he's talking about here. Is if you're into doing whatever it is just for the money. This is why Peter mentions over in 1 Peter chapter 2 and chapter 5 about the elders uh, he says, do not take this position for filthy lucre's sake. That is, not for making money. Uh, he, uh, Paul says in 1 Timothy 6, that, uh, 1 Timothy 5, that an elder, uh, an elder is uh, worthy, some elders are worthy of double honor. That is, they're preaching, uh, they're doing the work of an elder, uh, they really have a right uh, to be paid. But Peter and Paul both are saying, if you're entering into the eldership for the purpose of, of great gain, you have the wrong motivation. Uh, most elders I know aren't paid anything. Uh, but 
we understand that that's not the real motive behind this. Uh, and that people have corrupt minds. We are, we're all very acquainted with that. Uh, and those who have corrupt minds engage in perverse disputes, debates, uh, and they're destitute of the truth. You know, they don't have the truth, so they can't be contented with the truth. That's another way of, of looking at the Word of God. If, if you find peace of mind, if you find hope, if you find tranquility, if, if you find that substance that is able to nourish your soul, and that truth of God's Word is what does it, then you can understand what Paul is saying or warning about here when people who do not have the truth, they're destitute of the truth. Think about all the, your neighbors and friends, maybe family members, that are just destitute of truth. Not that you haven't presented it to them, but hard expression, they let it go in one ear and out the other. And so they're just, they don't have the truth. It's been presented to them, but they're, they fail to hear it. So all of these things enter into this situation here. I, yeah, I'm uh, looking at that here. Uh, you know, supposing the gain, the gain of God, and I'm not supposed to be talking about something physical here. Uh, uh, let's see. You'd have it for this first five, right? Yeah. One of the verses verse right down below that I thought we could really get into. It. Let's see. Oh, yeah, verse seven. And he goes, he goes on to make it pretty blunt. You know, we're bringing nothing into this world. We're not taking anything out. So, yeah. I, I thought that was a pretty good fit then. Yeah. <coughs> make the point, you know, the physical things are on over so much. Yeah. Right. That's, that's like the, the, you never see a picture of a hearse with a e haul. <laughs> I'm sure you've seen that picture before, but uh, you can't take it with you. And uh, people are struggling so much to. To build things in this life. And again, we're talking about good stewardship. As long as we have the things, the assets, the possession, there's nothing wrong with being rich as long as you handle it correctly in the sight of God. But just remember that all those possessions and assets that you have, you're going to have to leave behind. When you die, all this earthly material stuff is going to stay here until the Lord burns it up. So, it's good to, as I said a while ago, to be successful and to achieve and to set goals and, and to strive to do better. But even the very best that we can do and the very best that we have, it's all going to be a matter of, well, did you do this for the Lord? So we, we have a lot of people that, that don't understand that. 2 Timothy 3 2 says, For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, Proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. By this, we're simply saying that there are some in, in all their conscience practice these things. Uh, they love their own selves. Uh, Jane made a statement last uh, week to one of the ladies here, one of the girls here, about uh, the girl that asked her what she saw as far as the future is concerned. I'm not sure I get this right, but you get the gist of it. What the future held, what do you see the next thing happening? And Jane made the observation. She said, the people are becoming so self-centered and so selfish themselves that we're eventually getting to the point where they don't care about anybody else. Well, you can see this. Anytime you, you hear a murder inside 465 in Indianapolis or any place else, people have such little regard for life that it's all about me. It's all about themselves. And they... they your life means nothing to them. And I, I think Jane's probably right with that. I'm sorry I'm picking on you so much tonight, Jane, but you just say so much that's important. <laughs> and I appreciate it because that is true that we see so much of this happening. They love their own selves. They're covetous. They boast and they brag and they're proud. They blaspheme. They think nothing of using God's name in vain or anything that is divine or holy. They desecrate that by using bad language. Think of all the, the young people that are disobedient to parents. That they, they have no respect for their parents. And, and even, uh, we've talked about this in years gone by, the elder abuse. 
when the parents are older, there are children who may be up in years themselves, but have so little respect or regard for their parents that they don't take care of them or see to it that they are taken care of. Uh, and I can, again, go around the room with some of you here this evening that are good about taking care of your parents because you love them, you appreciate them, you, you're doing what you can to help them, but there, there are a lot of people out there that don't do that because they, they just don't care. You know, Glenn? That's a lot to do with the parents, too. Sure. Yeah. It's two-way street, yeah. yeah. James 2, 5. Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to them that love him? So here we're talking about a, a spiritual richness. Uh, we're talking about the poor of this world. That is, those who do not have the possessions, those, even if they do have the possessions, do not preoccupy themselves with those possessions. And their primary concern is uh, serving the Father, having the, the, the rich in faith, kind of what we were talking about uh, a moment ago. They're heirs, and there's a word that we oftentimes use when it comes, comes to money. Uh, we inherit and become heirs. First uh, John 2.15 addresses this in another familiar passage. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And so again, loving the world is a, a bad formula to practice. Matthew 19, 23 and 24. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. So that's just in a part again a what I've said already, it's not impossible, but it is hard because sometimes those riches, those assets and possessions get in our way of thinking spiritually clear thoughts. All right, for the sake of time then, let's go ahead to the next group about conscience. We've been dealing with the love of uh, money and the love of the right things. We go now to the subject of conscience. And in uh, Isaiah 30, at verse 21, And thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is the way, walk ye in it, when you turn to the right hand and when you turn to the left. So we need to train our conscience. Uh, we are told to go left, to go right, according to the narrow pathway of righteousness, Matthew chapter 7, 13 and 14. And so if we're guided by the Lord, then our conscience is going to be trained uh, it won't be uh, seared or burned as we'll talk about here in just a moment. Romans 2.15, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the mean while accusing or else excusing one another. So this is where the Roman people had gotten themselves, the Gentiles had gotten themselves into trouble uh, with the Lord uh, because they list down through the, uh, the end of chapter 1, about what the Gentiles were doing and uh, giving hearty approval to those who were doing evil things and then continues on into the second chapter down to verse 15 which is all we just read. Uh, the work of the law written in their hearts. So our hearts means our conscience is part of it. Uh, not the blood pump as we all know but we, we have uh, a heart of, uh, of righteousness a heart that is set on <clears throat> heavenly things. Uh, Colossians, uh, or excuse me, Hebrews 10 and verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So those first three passages there, Isaiah, Romans, and Hebrews. Any, let me stop for just a moment and uh, ask if there's any comments that you want to make. I think you can add to what we're saying here. In 1 Timothy 1 5. Now, the end of the commandments is charity out of a pure heart. We talked about this a little bit ago. And of a good conscience and a faith unfeigned. So, a good conscience. Remember in the introduction of the article that I read, we should never allow our conscience to be our soul guide because our conscience uh, can betray us sometimes. But when, even if it's educated, 
with regard to God's word. We're human beings, we make mistakes. So without a foundation of the truth of God, don't let your conscience be your sole guide. But this is the... Uh, sometimes our hearts are sprinkled from an evil conscience. Get away from an evil conscience. Some people can conscientiously kill others or steal from others or curse others or, or do anything to others and it doesn't bother them. They're con they have, we would say they have no conscience. Uh, well, the, the thing is they have a conscience but they're, they have not trained it. It's not been... It's, it's been taught evil things. Um, 1 Timothy 1 5. Now, the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfaithed. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. That's from Proverbs 3, a part of verses 5 and 6. Then we have Romans 14, verses 1 through 23. And of course, we won't have time to read all of that. But there's one verse here that says, in him that is weak in the faith receive you, but not to doubtful disputations. And so here, there's Romans 14 is talking about a stronger brother and a weaker brother. That's the context of all this. And ends up at verse 23 by saying, if you have any doubts, then don't participate in it. If your conscience is going to bother you, you think, well, I, I could do this, but I can't conscientiously do it because I have some moral scruples or I, I don't think this is right just in my own training or what I believe then don't do it. Stay away from it. This is where people get into trouble. They say, well, it's not going to hurt just to go ahead and do it. Yes, it will hurt. And so read Romans 14, 1 through 23 to talk about the weaker brother and the stronger brother. John says in 1 John 2, 27, that the anointing which you have received of him abides in you, and you, not, you need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it has taught you, you shall abide in Him. So again, here is the teaching. Here is the training for our conscience to be directed in the proper way. 1 Timothy 1.19, holding faith and a good conscience. Remember earlier we talked about the evil conscience. Uh, back up in uh, verse, uh, 1 Timothy 1.5, we talked about the good conscience. And then we, we talked about the evil conscience. Well, here again, 1 Timothy 1.19 talks about the good conscience. Well, some having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. It is possible when you put your conscience away and do those things <coughs> that would not be helping you to abide in Christ, <coughs> you make shipwreck of your faith. 2 Peter 3.16, having a good conscience. First, uh, Titus 1.15, uh, he talks about last phrase, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2. The Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of evil. This is what Titus was taught. Paul was talking about to Titus just a moment ago when we were talking about the, the conscience and making shipwreck, Timothy said back in 1 Timothy. Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy 1, 10, 19, the red one will go. Uh, Romans 13, 5, wherefore you must needs be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. In 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Then in uh, Acts 23, let's see, I can forward that for you for these last few that I've read. I guess this is Romans 13, 5 and 1 John 1, 9. I've read those two. We're down to Acts 23, 1. And Paul earnestly beholding the council said, Men, brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God to this day. Here's a perfect example of Paul conscientiously persecuting those that were in the way or Christians. And he said, I, I did it in all good conscience up till I was a changed man, a changed man, and my mind was changed. And of course, this was in Acts 9, Acts 22, on the road to Damascus, the light shone around about him, and he was converted, sent to Ananias, and Ananias said, Why are you tearing? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. And Paul says, this is the point that my life was changed. And everybody should reach that point. That we maybe have been able to do something conscientiously in the past that upon further training of God's Word would realize that it was wrong. So we need to, to be sure uh, that have a pure and a good conscience. Hebrews 13, 18, pray for us, for we trust we have a good conscience in all things 
willing to live honestly. There we go back to the last two Sunday sermons. We talked about honesty. And last Wednesday night we talked about honesty and integrity. Judge not that you be not judged. Matthew 7, verses 1 and 2. Matthew 9, 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without spot to God purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So all of these passages of Scripture have to do with the love of money and conscience. The two group together. Jeff? I've never thought this before, I don't think, but having all this together, it appears to me that the conscience is never a guide. The truth is a guide. And conscience is just a reminder of that truth. Very well put. That's exactly right. Yes. Exactly right. The truth is the foundation and it's the teacher and the conscience as you said is a reminder that's what we've got to work with well stated I, I kind of like it I'll think about that like the conscience of the bucket that holds the truth alright yeah. yeah. like, I'm the same thing he uh-huh. that, that was a really good point because mm-hmm. you got to have a guy for that and that's what the truth is right We've got about three minutes left. Anybody? I just purposely read through that so to get through them, and I didn't stop making many comments because I'd said enough already. But I want to give you plenty of chance, chance to say something. Now, I was just kind of thinking we hadn't mentioned anything about Solomon. Of course, you know, he's known for riches. Uh-huh. Of course, the end of his life, he's, he's starting to understand that that's definitely not everything. Yeah. Well, he goes into a lot of detail on all those things. Yeah, I've said this many times before too, but that since you mentioned Solomon, this is what makes Ecclesiastes so valuable. Because he starts out in the second chapter, after he starts out in the first chapter, he says, this is a grievous task that somebody's got to examine life as if there was no God. And so he said, that's what I'm doing. And then he goes to the second chapter of Ecclesiastes and talks about how, he, as you said, has all these possessions, all this gold. And he said, I'm going to have to leave all this behind, all this vanity, vanity of vanities. And he said, whatever I do, and whatever I fix up, and whatever I have in my castle, uh, where I live, the grounds and everything around, the next generation is going to come in and bulldoze them that away. Tear it down. Jay? In Proverbs 16, 16, he says, how much better to get wisdom than gold and understanding rather than silver. Yes. And that goes Proverbs sixteen sixteen. And that goes along with first Kings chapter three, where in his discussion with God, God says, Since you haven't asked for these possessions or for gold or silver, I'm going to give you wisdom like nobody else has ever had. And he follows up with that in Proverbs sixteen sixteen. So again, it's not to, I mean, we're talking about riches of all going rich people. Think of the taxes Solomon would have had to pay on the temple. <laughs> Uh, just because of the gold and all of the, the precious metals and all, and all the jewelry and, and everything. But it's a matter of how you handle those possessions. Anyone else? Dave? Yeah, I was trying to follow the love references in my strong, and it's agape every time mm-hmm. it mentions that. That selfless love that you've turned the money into. And I guess all the byproducts of it too. Yes. It's a good point. It's more than just brotherly love. It's the agape kind of love. Genuinely care and are concerned about self and about others. Okay, well, the Lord's willing, next week we'll be talking about Number 19, and uh, that has to do with, uh, again, charity and benevolence and attitudes toward our enemies. Uh, We've already covered maybe the first two a little bit, uh, quite a bit this evening, but let's uh, add what we learned tonight to the subject of how we treat our enemies. Uh, Kind of shift gears a little bit, and so work on that for next week.
For invitation tonight, um, I want you to turn to 556. I'll be reading it off the screen here in just a little bit. Uh, is is the life of a flower. And uh, in our invitation, we want to emphasize some of the lyrics that are in that song, but uh, not before I read a couple of scriptures. And so we'll come back to that song in just a few moments. Over in Isaiah 65, verses 5 through 7, or 64, verses 5 through 7, you meet him who rejoices in doing righteousness, who remembers you in your ways. Behold, you were angry, for we sinned. We continued in them a long time, and shall we be saved? That's our question for the invitation. Shall we be saved? For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment, and all of us wither like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. Then verse 7 of this text of Isaiah 64 says, There is no one who calls on your name, who arouses himself to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the power of our iniquities. And so here is a person who is steeped in sin, chooses to remain there as such, and fails to come to God to have their soul cleansed. And so in this invitation this evening, we want to encourage you to come uh, and, and to the Lord. Then adding to Isaiah's language in Jeremiah chapter uh, 8 at verse 20. Harvest is past, summer is ended, and we are not saved. There's just as about as succinctly put as we could this evening concerning the invitation. Uh, summer's pretty near gone, as we say in one county. Just about gone. Uh, the leaves not quite turning yet, but there's a tinge there that you can see. The air is a little fresher. I know we've got some hot days ahead, they say, but uh, we're noticing the change in the seasons. And so here we're thinking harvest is past. And I've got friends that have said that last week and this week they've got their soybeans out, they're getting the corn out. And so we're right up to that time. A lot of people don't have it out yet, but for all practical purposes and what we're talking about this evening, harvest is past. And summer is ended. It's over. In fact, what is it, the 21st or 22nd is the first day of fall, first day of autumn. Uh, and this is the 15th. So maybe another week, and we need to understand that summer is gone. And the question is, are we not saved? Are we saved or aren't we saved? And that brings us then to what I want to, to suggest from 1 Peter 1 and verse 24. For all flesh is a grass. We read about this in the, the leaf a moment ago in Isaiah's writings. All the glory of man is like the flower of grass. The grass withers and its flowers fall, and flower falls away. This song, as the life of a flower, and, and uh, I don't think we've sung it here, is one that goes back a long time. Decades ago, it used to be a favorite at funerals. Uh, a lot of uh, men and women I've known in, in years gone by said that, especially during the 30s, 20s and 30s, that they sung uh, the life of a flower as the life of a flower. And so the, the lyrics of this are what I want to share with you uh, in light of this invitation this evening. As the life of a flower, as a breath or a sigh, so the years that we live as a dream hastened by. True today we are here, but tomorrow we may see just a grave in the veil and a memory of me. As the life of a flower, as a breath or a sigh, so the years glide away, and alas, we must die. Line two, as the life of a flower, be our lives pure and sweet. May we brighten the way for the friends that we greet. And sweet incense arrived from our hearts as we live close to Him who doth teach us to love and forgive. And then again, the chorus is a life of a flower. Verse 3, While we tarry below, let us trust and adore Him who leads us each day toward the radiant shore where the sun never sets and the flowers never fade, where no sorrow or death may its borders invade. And again, the chorus of, uh, so the years glide away, and alas, we must die. So that's our invitation for the close of this service this evening. And we're going to be singing a song almost persuaded from Acts 26 and verse 28. And King Agrippa said to the Apostle Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to become a Christian. And hopefully in the reading of Isaiah, the reading of Jeremiah, the reading of First Peter, reading the lyrics of this song, 
have all pricked your heart to your saying, summer's gone. Am I lost or am I saved? Am I fully persuaded to obey tonight or just almost persuaded? Make your decision as together we stand and sing. Almost persuaded
There's nothing else to be announced. Uh, Steve, are you able to lead us in prayer? Okay. Okay. I also mentioned that David Elmore will be preaching Lord's Willing Sunday here. Uh, I'll be preaching at High School Road in Indianapolis, and then I have a wedding at 2.30 at Avon. And then Lord's Willing will be back here for Sunday night, but David's still going to preach Sunday night even if I am here. So <laughs> that's just kind of...